This is the beautiful day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice. We will be glad in it. Despite the state of the world, we, the people of God, will be glad in this beautiful day. We welcome you, one and all, to First Congregational Church, United Church of Christ, where no matter who you are, where you are on life's journey, we're delighted you're here, whether you're on the green or joining us from the comfort of your own home. Welcome. Today we rejoice to baptize a beautiful child of God, Ryland Deborah Curris, into the family of faith through the waters of baptism. She is the daughter of Jessica and Michael Curris and the granddaughter of Harry and Charlene Black. And I dare say that perhaps, I can't prove it, is Dick Epler here, maybe he can prove it, this might be the first outdoor baptism ever, or at least in the last one or two hundred years, and we're delighted for such beautiful weather to do it today. I call your attention to some announcements, some important announcements, beginning on page seven of your bulletin. I'll go through them very quickly. The first is that you all should have received either an electronic communication or a letter about moving worship indoors starting two weeks from today on October 25th. So today and next Sunday will be the last times we're able to gather outside uh, because of weather. And I understand next Sunday will be a little challenging, so dress warmly. Also, you'll see on page 8 some information about an Advent daily devotional booklet that we're putting together under Pastor Allison's leadership. Devotionals written by all of you for all of us for the days of Advent that are coming very quickly, and you can read about those on page 8. Also, an initiative of outreach gifts from the heart about gifts cards for the Department of Children and Family Services in Waterbury and Cheshire Social Services for Thanksgiving and Christmas. This takes the place of other initiatives we've done in the past. You can read about that on page 8, and I hope you'll be very generous. Also, we're still collecting pledges. We'll be collecting them until they all come in. So if you haven't had a chance to pledge, there is a, um, what do you call those codes? A pledge scan code on page 9. You can do it with your phone right now or go home and think and pray about it a little more. Finally, a call to congregational meeting. We're having a meeting, as you all probably have heard, and it is my duty now to read this to you. A meeting of the First Congregational Church, United Church of Christ, is called by the Executive Board for Sunday, October 25, 2020, on the church green at 11 a.m., immediately following the 10 a.m. indoor service. The meeting will commence at approximately 11 a.m. for the following purposes. To discuss a pr proposed change to the bylaws to allow congregational meetings to be done electronically as follows. Notwithstanding anything contained in these bylaws, if a meeting of this congregation is properly called and the church council determines that a traditional in-person meeting is not permitted by law or is otherwise not feasible due to extenuating circumstances, that such meeting may be held entirely by means of telephonic, electronic, or other communication facilities that permits all members of the congregation to communicate adequately with each other during the meeting. In the event such a meeting is to be held, the church council shall, notwithstanding anything contained in these bylaws, establish the procedures for the conduct thereof, including without limitation the procedures for determining if a quorum has been obtained, as well as voting by telephonic, electronic, or other communications facility, and will use Robert's Rules of Order as a reference as to how the meeting shall be conducted, signed Leah Sanders, Clerk of the Church. If you have any questions about that, please speak to a member of Church Council. Obviously, COVID has pushed us right up to the line with how we will conduct an annual meeting in January, and that is what this is about. Just a few words about worship, and then we'll start worship. When we pass the peace, as you all know, if you've been here, please refrain from physical contact, keep your distance, but be full of love and joy when you wish one another the peace of Christ. Offering boxes are here and here, plates are not passed, 
If you'd care to leave a gift or put your pledge there, you can do that on your way back to your car when worship is concluded. The children will go with Mrs. Marchand. Where is she? There she is. Um, right after the baptism is completed, they'll be dismissed to go to church school with her. Now, a word about baptism in the time of COVID. If you were here during confirmation, you saw this very beautiful act of families applying anointing oil to their sons and daughters as they were confirmed in the church. In the same way today, the ministers will provide on behalf of the congregation, but the families will apply the waters of baptism while the ancient words are said, and I suspect it will be a very lovely thing for all of us to behold. Now, friends, let us unite our hearts and voices as together we worship God. rise in body or spirit for the call to worship. Quiet your mind, still your restlessness, come before God. Warm your heart, stir up your spirit, come before God. Open your hands, meet the eyes of your neighbors. Come before God. Like rustling leaves blowing in autumn wind, bright with color, deep with gather, we fall into the presence of God.
congregation may be seated, and we invite at this time the baptismal family to come forward. For the time being, you can just stay right there, and then we'll call you up when it's time. They were bringing children to Jesus that he might touch them, and the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw that, he was indignant and said to them, Let the children come to me, do not hinder them, for to such belongs the realm of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not welcome the realm of God like a child shall not enter it. And Jesus took them in his hands and blessed them, laying his hands upon them. The sacrament of baptism is an outward and visible sign of the grace of God, inasmuch as the promise of the gospel is not only to us, but also to our children. Baptism with water and the Holy Spirit is the mark of their acceptance into the care of Christ Church, the sign and seal of their participation in God's forgiveness, and the beginning of their growth into full Christian faith and discipleship. So this question is for the parents. Do you desire to have your daughter, Ryland Deborah Curris, baptized into the faith and family of Jesus Christ? If so, please answer, we do. Yeah. Will you encourage her to renounce the powers of evil and to receive the freedom of new life in Christ? If so, please respond, we will, with the help of God. Will you teach her that one day she may be led to profess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? If so, please answer, we will, with the help of God. Do you promise by the grace of God to be Christ's disciple, to follow in the way of our Savior, to resist oppression and evil, to show love and justice, and to witness to the work and word of Jesus Christ as best as you are able? If so, please respond, we do, with the help of God. Do you promise, according to the grace given to you, to grow with your daughter in the Christian faith, to help her be a faithful member of the Church of Jesus Christ, by celebrating Christ's presence, by furthering Christ's mission in all the world, and by offering the nurture of the Christian Church so that one day Ryland may affirm her baptism for herself, if so, please answer, we do, with the help of God. And finally, will you love and accept Ryland for who God made her to be, especially if her path is not the one that you would choose? If so, please respond, we will, with the help of God. We will, with the help of God. And this is the question for the sponsors and godparents. Having heard today the desire of the parents to raise their daughter in the Christian faith, do you promise, if called upon, to do all you can to see that these promises are honored? If so, please answer, we do. To the congregation, people of God, do you, who witness and celebrate this sacrament, promise your love, example, and prayer as this child lives and grows in Christ. Affirming our, our unity with Christ and with the whole church, we joyfully accept our responsibility to support each child and family with constant love, Christian example, and faithful prayer. Christ be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. We thank you, God, for the gift of creation called forth by your saving word. Before this world had shape and form, your spirit moved over the waters. Out of the waters of the deep, you formed the firmament and brought forth the earth to sustain all life. In the time of Noah, you washed the earth with the waters of the flood, and your ark of salvation bore a new beginning. 
In the time of Moses, your people Israel passed through the Red Sea waters from slavery to freedom and crossed the flowing Jordan to enter the Promised Land. In the fullness of time, O oh God, you sent Jesus Christ, who was nurtured in the water of Mary's womb. Jesus was baptized by John in the water of the Jordan. Jesus became living water to a woman at the Samaritan well. Jesus washed the feet of his disciples with water and then sent them forth to baptize all nations by water and the Holy Spirit. To this water, we add these waters drawn from the Jordan River where Jesus himself was baptized. Okay, and come forward. So the first application of water, who's going to do that one? All right. Okay. Ryland Deborah Curris, we the people of God do baptize you in the name of the Father. We baptize you in the name of the Son. We baptize you in the name of the Holy Spirit. Turn around now. <laughs> Would you please welcome this newest member of the household of faith. And hear now these words of blessing. For you, Ryland, Jesus... Let me try again. For you, Ryland, Jesus Christ came into the world. For you, he lived and showed God's love. For you, he suffered the darkness of Calvary and cried at the last, it is accomplished. For you, he triumphed over death and rose in newness of life. For you, he ascended to reign at God's right hand. All this he did for you, Ryland, though you did not know it yet. So the word of scripture is fulfilled. We love because God loved us first. Go back to your seats. Thank you. Thank you. So as we come to a time of peace, we, a reminder that this is the time for our church school children to go with Mrs. Marchand, and a reminder to share signs of peace with one another. May the peace of Christ be with you. Congregation will please be seated. For this anthem, we're asking for your help. So, for Go Down Moses, whenever there's the refrain, let my people go, I'll raise my hand and please join in that refrain. Thank you.
Despite your firstborn dead, let my people go. from the book of Exodus in chapter 32, beginning with verse 1. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered around Aaron and said to him, Come, make gods for us, who, who shall go before us? As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Aaron said to them, Take off your gold rings that are on the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the gold rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron. He took the gold from them and formed it into a mold and cast an image of a calf. And they said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a festival to the Lord. They rose early the next day and offered burnt, sac burnt offerings and brought sacrifices of well-being, and the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to revel. The Lord said to Moses, Go down at once. Your people, whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt, have acted perversely. They have been quick to turn aside from the way that I commanded them. They have cast for themselves an image of a calf, and have worshipped it, and sacrificed to it, and said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, how stiff-necked they are. Now let me alone, so that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them. And of you I will make a great nation. But Moses implored the Lord his God and said, O oh Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say it was with evil intent that he brought, him, brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce wrath, change your mind, and do not bring disaster on your people. Remember Abram and Isaac and Israel, your servants, how you swore to them by your own self, saying to them, I will multiply your descendants like the stars of heaven. And all this land that I have promised, I will give to your descendants. 
and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord changed his mind about the disaster that he planned to bring on his people. May God add a blessing to the hearing of this holy word. Do you remember your first crush? Mine happened actually in kindergarten at a place called the Merle J. Abbott Elementary School in Fort Wayne, Indiana. I cannot remember her name, but I do remember her long dark hair and mysterious dark eyes. You see, in kindergarten, it's not really about romance, it's about fascination. And she fascinated me. One day, my mother took me to the grocery store. We rounded a corner and there she was with her mother standing by packages of ground beef, the things you remember. As our mothers chatted, I screwed up my courage and walked over to talk to her. I remember that she was wearing a deep red jacket, double-breasted, big black buttons with a matching beret. I remember feeling very tongue-tied and awkward. I remember that the little girl had a cold. I remember because all of a sudden that cold manifested itself as a discharge from her nose. I was completely taken aback and she was terribly, terribly embarrassed and that was the end of my crush because that was the end of my fantasy about her perfection. Her messy humanity ruined that. Messy humanity is forever ruining our notions of romantic perfection. When you first meet somebody, you'll remember this. You may have to try hard today, but you'll remember that when you first meet someone and the fires of desire are burning bright, all you see is their perfection. Everything they do is charming. You love their eyes and you love their laugh. You love the way they walk. You love their choice of clothes. They delight you. But at some point, and often sooner rather than later, messy humanity gets in the way. Their little quirks start to annoy you. Once charming, now not so charming. You see them in all sorts of moods and situations, you come to understand that they are actually humans, messy, complicated humans. Today's lesson from Exodus is a disturbing one. I don't know if you really listened and read along, but it's a disturbing one on many levels. Moses had been up on Mount Sinai for about 40 days, where he and God were having a very, very long conversation about everything you can imagine as it pertains to religion, the details of the law, the measurements of the tabernacle, the kind of furniture they were supposed to have, and what the liturgical vestments should look like. But the Hebrew people were not privy to any of that because Moses was way up on the mountain and they were way down below in the valley. All they knew for certain was that their leader, Moses, had disappeared without a trace. And that absence was significant. It was significant because in the ancient mind as well as in modern ones like ours, leaders are very often closely associated with something greater than they are, with the abstract. For example, the president travels to another country and for all intents and purposes in that moment, she or he 
is the United States, or at least an idea of the United States. The same was true for Moses. He was the powerful, visible reminder of their God, Yahweh, who had led them out of the land of Egypt. And so, when Moses disappeared without a trace for 40 days, it were as if God had disappeared. And that terrified the people because they were all alone in a hostile wilderness without protection, vulnerable to attack. And so they did. What people are wont to do when we're lonely or afraid, they reached for some instant comfort, instant gratification. They demanded a new God, something they could see and touch, like the gods they had seen in Egypt. And so they went to Aaron, who was Moses' older brother by three years, Moses' second in command, and they demanded, now imagine an angry mob of thousands and thousands of people demanding that Aaron make them a golden calf so they could worship it. To do that, they would have to relinquish all the gold they had plundered from the Egyptians, all their newfound wealth. That's what it was going to cost them. It was melted down and fashioned into the image of a calf, representing fertility and military might. Once it was completed, verse 6 reports that the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to revel, to revel, a word with sexual connotation. So it was quite a party. Well, God got wind of this up on the mountain, and God told Moses to get himself down the mountain and take care of it. God said, go down at once. Your people, Moses, whom you brought out of the land of Egypt, they have acted perversely, which sounds strangely like what my mother used to say to my father. Let me tell you what your son has done today. And then God became petulant. It's as if God's feelings are hurt. Now let me alone, God said. Lead me by myself, God said, so that my anger may burn against them and I may consume them. But of you, Moses, I will make a great nation. But... Moses somehow found the courage to stand in the gap with the Almighty. Moses cleverly referred to the people as God's people, not his. And then Moses pulled out the big guns, almost like a courtroom drama, and reminded God of the romantic beginnings he had had with these people. When everything was coming up roses, when everything they did was charming when things were not so messy. When God promised Abraham and Sarah that their descendants would multiply like the stars of the heavens and become a great nation, not Moses' descendants, Abraham and Sarah's. Well, all this reminiscing seems to have had an effect on the Holy One because the next thing you know, God changed God's mind. God was sorry for the words of judgment spoken in anger. And isn't that an odd thing to think about? And yet, this is not the only time in Scripture that we are told that God changes God's mind. Do you remember the story of Jonah and the great fish? God was all set to destroy Nineveh, but after Jonah warned the people, and after the people repented, God changed God's mind 
and had mercy on them. Like I said in the beginning, this is a disturbing story on many, many levels. First of all, what those people did when they were left by themselves, what they did in their frustration and fear is not at all foreign to me when I am frustrated and afraid and need some comfort. I know what it's like to reach for instant gratification, especially in these days of fear. I am amazed at how quickly I, a pastor, will look for someone, anyone, anything to save me. I have some idea of what my golden calves are. What are yours? So that's disturbing to think about for me anyway. But so is this. God was ready to do away with those people because of their betrayal. Frightened and alone, they self-medicated. That seems human enough to me, but it really seemed to tick God off. Frankly, that frightens me just a little bit, and I wonder, does the Almighty ever think of bumping me off? Or you? And finally, consider this. How is it that the one who is in control of the whole universe, the one who knows everything, suddenly makes a course correction as if God learned something new. What does it mean to say God changed God's mind? Now this last one perhaps is most disturbing of all, mostly because we view it through the lens of something called scholastic theology. What's that, Campbell, you might be wondering? It's simply this. Scholastic theology is a theology where first human beings articulate a doctrine, something we decide is true, and then we establish an elaborate system to defend it. Scholastic theology then takes the stories of the Bible and forces them through a preconceived the theological structure. Everything has to fit. So, for example, because God is perfect and God knows everything, then the idea of God changing God's mind must be an allegory. It cannot be a description of the way God really is because it doesn't fit into our theology. But, what if we simply let this story and all the other stories of the Bible speak for themselves. What if we stopped treating spiritual truth like arithmetic or a science project and simply let the truth emerge in its own messy way? What wondrous thing might we learn? If we let this story speak for itself, then we might learn, we might come to understand that the God of the Bible is not some impassive deity. Instead, God freely enters into relationship with messy people like me. This God is passionate. This God is emotional and frankly, crazy in love with us, we are told in the pages of Scripture. And because love is dynamic, and because God is love, the Scriptures declare, then God is dynamic and in movement with the creation. Doesn't the incarnation of Jesus Christ tell us that, show us that? 
In his seminal book, The Crucified God, German theologian Jürgen Moltmann argues that the incarnation of Jesus Christ in that we see a relationship in which humans cause God grief and suffering, but God does not withdraw, God does not give up. In costly love, God embraces humanity and is pierced and wounded in the act. God is pierced and wounded in the act. So maybe the Hebrew people's preference for a golden calf broke God's heart. Maybe that pierced his heart. And maybe it hurt. And maybe in the messiness and pain of that betrayal, God even thought about being rid of them and starting over. But the good news of the gospel is simply this. Love would not allow that. God's love overwhelmed God's justice. It always does. And for that, let all of us messy sinners say, thanks be to God. Amen. to our time of prayer it is our practice to hear whatever joys or concerns are on your hearts that we may share in the joy together that we may bear the burdens together now because we are so wonderfully spread out this morning pastor james will hear the prayers the joys and the concerns on this side and i will come among you on this side so that we may hear everyone that you wish to raise up are there any joys or concerns to share this morning? Yes, sir. For the 
joy of being together. For Jan's niece, Charlene, who is having surgery on Friday. According to Jim, today is Pastor Appreciation Sunday, and so Jim offers on everyone's behalf their appreciation for you and me. For the joy in Tracy's family, two years ago, Hurricane Michael came and destroyed her mother's house. And in these two years, they have rebuilt, and this week she was finally able to inhabit her home again for safekeeping. Prayers for David, who is having shoulder surgery on Thursday. Prayers of God's healing. Are there any others? Thanksgiving for 38 years of wedded bliss to my wife, Robin. <laughs> okay. So many of us feel at this particular time, especially in to the election that is coming. We celebrate with Jessica and Mike and the entire extended family on this day of Ryland's baptism. Are there any other prayers this morning? And the Lord be with you. For the, all the prayers that we have raised together and all the prayers that are in our hearts, let us come together. Always beckoning God, we give you thanks and praise for bringing us to this new day. Your love never fails, not even when we turn away from you. When we ignore your invitation or desert you for gods of our own making, even then, you do not abandon us, but reach out again and again, inviting us back into relationship once more. Thank you, Holy One, for never simply letting us be, but for challenging our sense of what is possible in our walk with you. Remind us of your steadfast love when we find it hard to see and hear you when we strain to hear your guidance and your wisdom and your ways of love above the noise and shouting that wearies and numbs us. Remind us of your accompanying presence when we miss the physical company of friends and family, when we worry for the welfare of our loved ones whom we hear through speakers and see through screens. Comfort us ground us, and reassure us in these trying times, nurturing God. Hear our prayers, Holy One, for all who suffer in body, mind, or spirit, and for all who provide care for the needs of others. Hear us as we lift up those who grieve the loss of loved ones, and we pray for your comfort. We pray for those who wander in anxiety and wildernesses of despair and restlessness of mind and spirit, and for them we ask for your peace. We pray for the world you created and the people and creatures who share it with us. It is your vision who lifts our eyes from the ground and toward a more just and whole and inclusive world. Bless the hungry and move us to feed. 
Bless the jobless and move us to engage. Bless the unhoused and move us to raise shelter. Move in us, Holy One, and remind us of the work of your church to bring the good news into the midst of brokenness. All of this we ask in the name of the one who calls us forward in faith. And with the words he taught us together, we pray for our needs this day, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. By God's goodness, we are called to be a community of church. And by God's grace, we rejoice to share in its mission and ministry through the offerings of our resources, through the offerings of our time, of the work of our hands, and of the love in our hearts. For those who would like to give this morning, the offering boxes are here on either side. And so let us please rise in body or spirit as we sing the doxology as a way to dedicate our offerings to God's holy purpose. Since we all rely upon the fact that God is love and God is merciful, let us live lives of love and mercy. Let us extend to others the same grace that we have received. And in doing so, may we praise God's name by the way we live. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, loving Mother of this whole creation. Amen. 